thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you, and uh, a genuine delight to be here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that every guest speaker who stands on this platform says something like that. You know, it's the, they're always thrilled to be here, because um, that's what you say. It genuinely is a privilege to stand on this platform, but especially uh, to be here in friendship with you, C3. I've been, Kay and I have been coming here for about 220 years now, and um, we love this church. Steve and Angie are dear friends. They've been in our home in Colorado, and we've walked through some laughter and some tears together. And uh, I haven't got permission to say this, but it's sometimes easier to get forgiven than it is to get permission. But I just want you to know, as one of the advisors, the diligence and the behind-the-scenes stewardship and the way that things are done here that most never see it is just outstanding and a real credit to your leaders. So, yeah, express some appreciation because that's wonderful. If you're watching live online, uh, especially to the new congregation, the C3 congregation in Paris, so excited to have you. Bonjour and all of that. Um, great to have you. And if you're joining us from prisons across the UK as well, we're honored to have you with us as well. Steve mentioned um, books. Uh, this book came out a couple of years ago now, Singing in Babylon, Finding Purpose in Life's Second Choices. When I wrote this, I had no clue what was ahead. Um, um, no idea about pandemics or anything like that. Let's face it, with all that's been going on, we've all been living second choices. Daniel knew how to do that, the biblical character of Daniel. And, and forgive the commercial, uh, if, if you will, but um, I've started um, publishing daily Bible reading notes. I was doing those for about 17 years, and we've taken over a kind of a new publication now. It's quarterly, Life with Lucas. It's also got links online and videos that you can visit online. It's kind of, we're trying to take Bible reading notes to a new level. You can buy the individual notes. Also, you can get an annual subscription today, and we'll give you over half your money back. It's 20 pounds. Is it 20 pounds? And we'll give you like 12 pounds worth of books back. Everybody just go like, I'm amazed. I oh, know, it's staggering. I can't get over it. So um, those are available for you. So the title for my message um, today is The Verdict is In, We Are Justified. And uh, I'm going to read to you two portions of Scripture from the book of Romans, Paul's letter to his Christian friends in Rome. And in chapter 3 uh, and verse 24, the Apostle Paul says this, now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus." And then when you turn over to the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul continues uh, this discussion, and then he says these amazing words, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death." Uh, in my experience, jet lag, jet lag does some rather strange things to a person. I've experienced a lot of it. Um, I've traveled about three million miles eating food, unrecognizable as food, with my legs wrapped around my neck. And um, I'm trying to cut down on it. It's not good for me. It's not good for the environment. Uh, uh, it hasn't been good to me. Look at me. I'm only 26, and all this air travel has really messed me up. But jet lag you can make you feel disorientated and confused. Some years ago, um, my wife Kay and I flew to America, and uh, we checked in at this hotel, motel really, the Bates Motel, I think it was called. And um, there's a nine-year-old standing behind the counter, and as we walked up to the counter uh, to check in, we gave our details, and then he turned to my lovely wife Kay, and he said, Kay, is there an E at the end of your name? And my delightful jet-lagged wife said, yes, there's an E at the end of my name. It's K-A-Y-E. 
Now, I didn't want to get into an argument. I didn't want to be c contrary, but I, I turned to her and said, darling, I've known you for many years. And um, as far as I understand it, and I've also seen your birth certificate, um, um, there has never, ever been an E at the end of your name. Forgive me for pointing that out, but it just happens to be a fact. And the nine-year-old looked really confused. He's like, what is the matter with these people? For just one moment, and sanity was quickly restored. And I do, by the way, have permission to share this story. I do want you to know that. But for just one moment, Kay forgot who she was. <laughs> she forgot her own name. And it seems to me, ladies and gentlemen, that a similar malady can hit Christians. We in perhaps not fully grasping what Jesus has done for us, we forget who we are. And when we forget who we are, to quote Michael Griffith's classic book from the 1970s, we become like Cinderella with amnesia, a princess who has forgotten her identity. And when we forget who we are, we forget how to live. And then this very idea of freedom in Christ it becomes a doctrine that we declare and sing about on Sunday, but not one that we live in and experience on Monday. And in writing to the church in Rome, Paul wants them to know who they are and what Christ has done. And he uses an illustration. He paints a picture of a courtroom scene. There is a judge and there is a defendant in the dock. And the defendant is the whole of humanity, including me and including you. So let's just dive in and see what we can see here. The first thing is this. First of all, like in any courtroom, the charges are read. And Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I am embarrassed to tell you that there was a day in my life when I stood before a judge, um, and not because I was giving evidence. Um, I, um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but, and I'm not making light of speeding, but there's this road near Denver Airport, and it's a 70 mile an hour speed limit, my lord, and then very quickly it drops to 50. And so I'm a bit late for the airport and I'm driving. I didn't slow down quick enough. And there is this policeman on the top of the hill, a demon-possessed policeman. <laughs> and he was sitting there waiting for me. It's all part of a global conspiracy. And I went screaming up the hill at about 63 miles an hour. And he decided he wanted a little chat with me. And uh, I'm think, I saw the light behind me. And my instant thought was, is that fish still on the back of my car? Some of you won't understand that. It matters not. So he pulls me over and, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. And I wept and begged for mercy. And he said, you're going to have to go to court because you were 13 miles uh, over the speed limit. So I went to court. I put my suit on. And some friends came with me. They said to support me. That was a lie. It was for their entertainment. I know that. <laughs> and we all sat at the back. You know, not my, me and my friends. Everybody who was up before the judge. This, like, sin bin. And we're all looking at each other thinking, I wonder what he's in for. You know, I wonder what he's done. And one by one, people went up before the hanging judge. And um, he would ask them if they were guilty or not guilty. And then it was my turn, and my friends were giggling. They said they were praying. They were giggling. And I went up, and I stood in front of him, and he forgot to ask me if I was guilty or not guilty. And I know the way these things are supposed to be done. So I'm just about to say, excuse me, your worshipfulness. You have not followed court procedure. But I'm thinking, that is not going to end well. So I just took the guilty declaration, paid the fine. It was horrible. But for a moment, I didn't know whether I was guilty or not guilty. There was confusion in the courtroom. Paul wants to drive a truck through any confusion that we might have as human beings because he says this, 
All have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short. Fallen short is a phrase that Paul uses seven times elsewhere in his letters to denote a lack of something. And he's saying this. It's not just that we're not good people. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we've fallen short of the glory of God. You see, it was always intended that humanity made in the image of God would reflect God's glory. It's not just that we've messed up a little bit. Paul is saying, no, we've all fallen short of that glorious vision. It's not just that we're not good people. We're not glorious people. And when he says fall short, the Greek word is in the present tense, which means we keep on falling short. And Paul wants to know, this is everybody. One scholar puts it quite dramatically. The thief, the liar, the murderer are short of God's glory, but so are all of us. Perhaps they stand at the bottom of a mine in our thinking, and we on the crest of an alp in our thinking, but we are as little able to touch the stars as they. We have all Sinned. Why do heinous dictators declare war on innocent civilians? Because all have fallen short. All have sinned. Why are so many wrapped up in destructive behavior to themselves and others? Because all have sinned. Why are so many relationships in disarray? Because all have sinned. Why is human trafficking still an untamed curse? Because all have sinned. Why is there a picture of a sitting member of parliament on the front pages of the newspapers today with four lines of cocaine pictured in front of him, allegedly with the uh, uh, accusations of sexual abuse and now he's lost the party whip and we don't know the reality behind that but why does this happen all have sinned ladies and gentlemen that's why our message and mission is still so utterly relevant this is not just about us having a happy little sing time on Sunday mornings this is about not just looking at the symptoms of the problems of humanity but going to the very heart of the problems that's why the Christian mission is the most significant and important mission in the history of the cosmos. I'm getting a bit excited. Sorry about that. It's, no, it's, it's, my wife's looking at me like, calm down, calm down. All have sinned. And it might be that today, here in this venue, watching online, today is the day to come to that recognition. To realize that rescue is needed. A savior has come. But then secondly, the verdict is in. Paul says, and all are justified freely by his grace. Wow, he takes a 180 degree turn because immediately as the charges are read, the verdict is announced. And Paul says we are justified. Now what does that mean? It's a it's a legal or forensic term. It belongs again to the law courts. It's the opposite of, of condemnation. God declares us not guilty for our sins. And listen, he does it now. Our Jewish friends believe that the righteous will be justified on the day of judgment. But Paul says, no, now we are justified now declared not guilty. And just of all have sinned, umbrella statement, Paul says, and all are justified. This is for everybody who has put their faith in Christ. And this is more than forgiveness. This isn't, don't make a mistake about this. This is not just a pardon or forgiveness. This is a legal verdict where God says you are justified. It is just as if you'd never sinned. He's not saying we are perfect. We know that. It's not a judgment or a declaration about our current morality. Rather, a statement about our position before him. And we struggle with that. I got an email this week that said I've won 35 million on the lottery. I'm a little suspicious. Mainly because I didn't do the lottery. And we've been conditioned to not believe in anything that's free. It's part of being grown up. 
You, you give an adult a gift when it's not Christmas or their birthday. Watch them shrivel. Well, you shouldn't have. I didn't get you anything. I feel awful. I give my 10-year-old grandson, Alex, if I give him a Mars bar, he doesn't say, Granddad, I'm not worthy. <laughs> no. 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 Thrice, no. No, I haven't cleaned my room since birth. The Mars bar disappears down the infant throat at the speed of light. Why? Because children, one reason why Jesus celebrated them, are so able to receive freely. Why is the unconditional love of God so difficult to get when it comes to us? It's because it stands alone in the universe. It's like trying to explain to the human mind the physics of a black hole. And I've got GCSE grade five physics. It doesn't compute, duh. There is no example of unconditional love anywhere in the cosmos except in the heart of God. Even the closest marriage can be trampled on by abuse or neglect. But the love of God stands singularly solitary. Alone in the universe. No wonder we say, what? It's like putting the power of a nuclear power station through a 13 amp plug. You don't blow up the plug, you blow up the city. Perhaps this is why the Apostle Paul lets us know in Romans 8 and in Galatians 4 that the Holy Spirit enables us to cry, Abba. Father, it is not just as a result of a human transaction, it is a result of a supernatural engagement with the Spirit of God. Because if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 17, they are new creations, the old is gone, the former has passed away. There is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit enabling us to say, Daddy. We are worse than what we think we are. But we are more loved than we could ever imagine. Thirdly, we are free to go. There is now no more condemnation. The judge has said, not guilty. What, 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 what a wonder that must be to the prisoner in the dock when the judge says, you're free to go. I've told this story here before. I've told most stories here before. Years ago, I was having my physical exam with my doctor, who's also my best friend, which is awkward. I won't go into it. You can imagine. And I was just about to leave, and he said, you need to go and get an X-ray. So I went down the hallway to the X-ray room, lady standing in there, couch, X-ray machine, lead apron sitting on the couch. I was a bit flummoxed. I just wanted to get in, get out. I said, what is the lead apron for? And she said, it is for the protection of the gonads. And I remember thinking, as some of you are thinking, what are those? <laughs> some of you are thinking, did he just say what I thought he said? <laughs> yes, I did. You've got O-level biology. Get over it. And uh, I said, he said, she said, it's a for the protection of the gonads. And I remember thinking, I don't know what those are. So I'm trying to think about what they might be. And I wasn't really listening to her next instruction. And I thought she said, put that around your neck. <laughs> but for those of you with the basic knowledge of human physiology, you'll be aware that she actually said, put that around your waist. But I didn't hear that. <laughs> so. She popped off for a cup of coffee and I picked up 25 pound worth of lead and I hauled it up on my chest and I tied the biggest bow you ever did see and now I'm hunched over like this. And I begin to pray that she would come back. After a while I begin to pray that our Lord Jesus would come back. And after about three hours, probably three minutes, but it felt like three hours. She came back in and she took one look at me. She was so professional. I know she wanted to lie on the floor and kick her legs in the air and just laugh. But she took one look at me and she just went, no, no. <laughs> it 
it's laughable. And living like it is tragic. Lewis Smedes, who wrote so brilliantly about shame, he said, shame is a very heavy feeling. It's a feeling we don't measure up. Maybe we'll never measure up to be the sorts of people we're meant to be. The feeling, when we're conscious of it, gives us a vague disgust with ourselves, which in turn feels like a hunk of lead on our hearts. You see, guilt is a good thing. We all need guilt. It's good to feel guilty when you are. Without guilt, we become sociopathic, psychopathic. I am praying, I'm not sure whether I should say this, but oh well, I am praying for Mr. Putin to bump into an 18-foot angel with a big sword and yellow Doc Martens, fluorescent. I am praying that not only Mr. Putin, but the leaders of our world will not only have an idea of what is right, but a, a revelation of the, the, not only the goodness of God, but the justice and the power of God. We need to know the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt says you did something wrong. Shame says you're rubbish. And why does shame so affect us? Well, we tend to define ourselves by our worst moments. When someone mentions parenting, we've got a great relationship with our kids, but I, does anybody else as a parent, you look back on the worst moment in your parenting? Like when I tried to teach my daughter how to drive. There should be something in the Bible about that. <laughs> Proverbs 19.4, Ride not in thine daughter's chariot, for if thou dost, it will not go well for either of thee. We define ourselves by our worst moments. Sometimes shame comes from a damaged conscience. The conscience is important, but it's not infallible. Always let your conscience be your guide, they say. That's not in the Bible. That's Jiminy Cricket to Pinocchio. And shame is part of spiritual warfare. Satan's primary strategy is not temptation. It is accusation. The word Satan means accuser. Five times the psalmist talks about human accusers and he calls them Satans. If Satan can beat us up with shame, temptation will be an easy, easy transaction. We need to accept God's grace by faith. Honor him by accepting that grace. Stop arguing with him. He says, it is finished. We don't say, excuse me, it's not. We need to wash our minds with truth and stand in the goodness of God. Well, the last thing is this, number four. And that is back to the future, the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul says in verse 23, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Do you see what's happening here? Suddenly, Paul takes us out from the courtroom to a lonely hillside outside a city wall in Jerusalem. And he shows us that this is not just some legal contract thing. He takes us not just to a principle, but to the person of Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus, Paul is saying. And we look at Jesus as we draw closer to Easter hanging naked on a cross because the artists painted something to protect his modesty, but the Romans crucified people naked to further shame them in their dying. And Paul points us back to Jesus, and then he says in Romans 6, so shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. He's saying, you don't get declared not guilty and then pop out and rob a bank. He's not saying we're never going to sin again. Provision is made for that. But he is calling us to a life of transformation, brothers and sisters, because if we truly walk with Jesus, transformation on a slow daily basis is not just possible, it's inevitable. As I conclude, Paul also points us to our glorious future. On the one hand, he says, we've fallen short of the glory. But then later in Romans 8, he says, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He's saying, we, we, we fell short. We lost the glory. But hey, in the future, in Christ, we will be glorious.
reflecting his image because Jesus has beaten the powers of death and hell. That's why we sing, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. That's why we sang earlier, faithful in every season, he won't fail. That's what Carl knew when he shared with you, Steve, about his beloved 15-year-old daughter. Perhaps what he knew in the faithfulness of God is that while none of us relish tragedy and suffering and pain, we are invited today in these turbulent days, yes, of chaos and uncertainty, to quietly stand firm on the evil day and having done all stand because Christ has beaten it all and he's not finished with the planet no condemnation justified let's pray Lord, we thank you for the treasures of your word and the glorious things that you don't just say to us, but the things that you have done for us. Justified, no condemnation. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, who helps us cry, Abba, Father, that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts in this place for those watching online, in prisons around the country, that you will be the glory and the lifter of heads. And where people have been crushed by shame, that they might know not only forgiveness, but justification in you. Before I conclude this prayer and then we just continue to worship time has gone but I just want to invite some of us if we need to respond to this message we are so good some of us at defining ourselves by our worst moments you know what I'm talking about I just invite you where you're seated you can do this at home wherever you are to just open your hand in front of you as a gesture to say my hand is empty but help me to receive this truth some of us shamed not because of what we've done but because of what people have done to us Holy Spirit work freedom before we worship I just invite you to whisper this word that means daddy Abba thank you for your presence here Take the seeds of your word and bring good fruit. We agree in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me if you're able? We're going to continue to worship the Lord together. enjoyed this video today why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video and if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 church for a little while now why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be